Well, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, so I might be the only meteorologist in the room, so I'll, I'll take the credit for the weather today. <clears throat> but the bad weather you're going to have tomorrow is not my fault. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, this, about the, the issue of environmental corrosion that takes place on the limestone surfaces of the uh, Mesoamerican heritage sites in Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America. And uh, as uh, Dr. Tripathi said, uh, I do each year teach a study abroad course where I bring groups of students down to Mexico to research and to study this very thing. And uh, that's very unusual because in the world of atmospheric science, study abroad uh, basically doesn't exist. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to start you off with a movie, a video, because everybody likes videos, right? The course begins with a couple of days in Milwaukee with traditional classroom instruction that includes some Spanish instruction. Then we travel to Mexico. of like acid rain and air pollution on the ancient structures. The archaeological sites are subject to corrosion at the hands of the environment. Uh, the air pollution has the effect of slowly eroding the surfaces. If you find a line, it's five. So you're 12, this one is 11. Our first destination is Mexico City. So after a couple of days there, we take a first class bus to Papantla, Veracruz. We go there because outside of the town, there's a site called El Tajin. After uh, El Tajin, we travel to Oaxaca. The trip part has been Oaxaca, I think. It was just great being in a different place and seeing the different ways people live. And even their houses are different here. After Oaxaca, we fly to Ciudad del Carmen. Most study abroad trips go to one city, and here you go to five different cities. Finally, after uh, Ciudad del Carmen, we traveled by bus to Palenque. My favorite thing so far about the trip was hiking through the rainforest in Palenque and walking through like mudslides and waterfalls and little streams with clear water. It's gorgeous. The students learn not only about the, the sites themselves, but about the history, the culture, the anthropology of the peoples that lived there. In addition, it's also a research trip. Once it rains, we stand outside with the funnels and collect it. Then once we do that, we take pH strips to test the acidity of the rain. And once we get all that data collected, we go to a website to try to figure out where the pollution came from. Meeting amazing people, building new friendships, like networking with other students, and definitely just being in a whole new environment, it's inspired me. You can only get so much from a book. There are whole other worlds outside of the United States. Like, traveling just within the United States doesn't, it doesn't cover it. Okay, that's the end of the video. Now you have to listen to me. Okay, so stuff that's on the, uh, stuff that's written here is basically a reminder to, to me, so I remember what to say. Uh, so first I want to uh, <clears throat> let you know how I got involved in this business. I mean, I'm a meteorologist, I work at UWM, and just like a typical university professor at UWM, half my job is teaching, half my job is research, more or less. And, uh, I, so in 2001, uh, my wife and I decided to take our kids, who are now 21 and 24, uh, to somewhere to practice our Spanish. Because uh, I learned some Spanish in high school and college a little bit, having forgotten most of it by then. My wife, same deal. And my kids were starting to learn it in middle school and in 
um, grade school where they teach them kind of like teaser, lang teaser language classes. And uh, by looking at a combination of geography and uh, the cost of airfares, we figured out that the cheapest place that we could go where we could actually speak Spanish, you know, as opposed to like Cancun, for example, where you can get cheap flights, but it's a tourist destination, everybody speaks English there, uh, was Mexico City. So we decided to go to Mexico City. We stayed there, we pulled the kids out of school. They were young, we could get away with that then. Uh, and uh, we went to Mexico City and we stayed at uh, this kind of divey uh, backpacker style hotel where the people who work there did not study, you know, um, tourism in school, and so therefore they could not speak English, and that was exactly what we wanted. We had a little vacation. We were all able to practice our Spanish, and everything was wonderful. Well, while we were there, you know, me being the meteorology nerd that I am, I decided to go visit the university there where they have the University of Mexico. It's called UNAM, U-N-A-M. It's, uh, that's the... Spanish abbreviation for it. Uh, it's the largest university in Latin America, 250,000 students, if you can believe that. Uh, and um, they have a center for, they have a, uh, what's it called? I'm translating here, Atmospheric Science Research Center. And so I had looked them up, and there was this guy there named Humberto Bravo. He was one of the scientists. And I didn't know him, but his name was familiar to me because in graduate school or something, I'd read a couple of his articles. He's a pretty famous guy in the world of air pollution research. So I invited myself for a visit, essentially. And it was nice. I went there for the afternoon. My wife took the kids shopping or something. And uh, I went there. I got a little tour. I met him and then the other people who worked there. And it was all great. Well, the next year, uh, this guy, Bravo, he coincidentally had a sabbatical in Cincinnati. So he called me up one time and said, hey, I'm, I'm in Cincinnati. Uh, you invited yourself over to my place. I'm inviting myself over to your place. <laughs> you know? And in his mentality, Cincinnati was right next door to Milwaukee. You know? and, <clears throat> you know. So uh, I brought him over to Milwaukee and we started talking and uh, how's the sabbatical going? What are you doing on your sabbatical? Blah, blah, blah. And I happened to mention that I had a sabbatical coming up and he said, what are you doing for your sabbatical? I said, well, I don't know. I haven't really figured it out yet. He says, well, why don't you come to Mexico City for your sabbatical? So I looked into it and uh, I, I applied for a Fulbright grant and I got a Fulbright grant and that allowed me to um, bring my family to Mexico City. And we were there for five months. And that was in 2003. So, <clears throat> all right, so on the one hand, I was um, doing research in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bravo's group. And he had a bunch of projects and I was uh, doing a little bit um, for several different projects. And in his group, they're all chemists, which is common in uh, air pollution research. Usually, you know, it's chemists and there's one meteorologist who, you know, the chemists say, hey, we have all these measurements, you know, the, the chemical measurements, they go up, they go down, we don't know why. And the meteorologist says, I know why. You know, it's because the wind direction changed or something like that, right? So I was the lone meteorologist in the group, and I'm used to that. I've, I've been in that position a lot. But something really unusual happened. So Mexico is uh, not as economically advanced, obviously, as the United States is. And um, there's only one laboratory in the country, or I should say at that time there was only one. Now there's two that has um, some very modern and necessary equipment for analyzing the chemical content of air pollution. Ion chromatographs, liquid chromatographs, uh, other instrumentation. They had one in, uh, at the University of Mexico in Mexico City. So it's common that the scientists that research air pollution in Mexico, they collect their samples, 
It might be air drawn through a filter or rain collected in a bucket or whatever. They store their samples and they bring them to Mexico City to Dr. Bravo's lab for analysis. And uh, so I was there for five months and there was probably three or four delegations, shall we say, of scientists and students, whatever, from here, there, that came over with that. Well, um, so Dr. Bravo was good about introducing me to the visitors that would come. And uh, the reaction that these people had was all the same and it was really weird. You know, they would meet me and he would introduce me as, uh, you know, a meteorologist from Milwaukee visiting, staying here for several months. And they would say, a meteorologist? Really? Can you come to my university? Uh, because I didn't know this at the time, but it turns out that it is really, really hard to learn anything about meteorology in Mexico. Uh, there's only one university that offers a degree program, and that's in Jalapa, Veracruz, where jalapeno uh, peppers were named after, Jalapa. Uh, and, um, you know, the economic status of most university students in Mexico is such that they can't easily travel to another city, different part of the country, to study a subject which might be relevant to their own major, uh, but not available at their own university. So um, people in environmental fields, which in Mexico is most commonly chemical engineering, but uh, you know, people having anything to do with the environment who normally would take a, a class or two in meteorology can't do it. So I met uh, groups of people from three different universities and I got invitations to come and give like a two or three day workshop in, on meteorology in each of those three universities. And it wasn't because I'm special. I'm not really special. It was because I was a meteorologist and, you know, that's, uh, that's unusual for them. So I uh, began doing that regularly, even beyond 2003. You know, a couple times a year, I would get asked to, to come down to various universities to give two, three-day workshops. Sometimes it increased to four or five days. I never accepted their offers of salary, um, their offers of payment, because I, I, I let them pay my expenses, my travel and stuff, but I kind of figured it was sort of my professional service or something like that. And uh, this kind of grew and grew and it morphed into the situation now where now I teach a full semester class every summer in Mexico called uh, Meteorological Aspects of Air Pollution. I, I cram it into two or three weeks because I don't like to be away for four months or something. Uh, and so that's what I do. So I kind of developed this niche for myself pretty much accidentally. And um, these are the places <clears throat> where I go most frequently. Uh, Monterey I don't go to, I haven't gone to for a while because that's a place that uh, has a lot of the, the drug violence activity and the U.S. State Department has warned um, Americans to stay away from that place. So I, I've been staying away from there. But the other places I go. Okay, so that's how I got involved in this Mexican research. Now, um, the project that uh, I worked on the most, oh, here's what I'm looking for. The project that I worked on the most in, uh, when I was in Mexico City for that time in 2003 was this problem of um, acid rain damage to some of the archeological sites, especially uh, this one particular one called El Tajin. And uh, that project just kind of grabbed me and I really liked it and I kind of ran with that project and I worked on it more than some of the others. So let me uh, sort of switch from, you know, from my background to some of the science stuff now. So let's talk a little bit about acid rain. So this is an overview of acid rain. Acid rain is a really complicated and interesting phenomenon. It essentially is the atmosphere's natural mechanism for cleaning itself. So on a global scale, acid rain is a good thing. You know, we put garbage into the atmosphere. You know, we burn stuff to make stuff, right? I mean, we humans do that. And uh, you put the pollution into the atmosphere, and guess what? It comes out. That's a good thing. Otherwise, it would just get more polluted and more polluted and more polluted forever. 
Not so good if it comes out on you, but that's acid rain. So um, the process works like this. The emissions, that means uh, that's where the pollutants get emitted, in, get put into the atmosphere. So these can be direct emissions like, uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon monoxide uh, gas that, uh, it, that you get from uh, burning fuel, like in a car. They can also be what we call secondary emissions. So that's like ozone, where no, nothing emits ozone into the atmosphere. Ozone forms via chemical reactions involving pollutants that are already in the atmosphere. And they can also be natural. Most of the stuff that's not air in the atmosphere is natural. Uh, particulates from forest fires, salts from uh, sea spray, from breaking waves, uh, volcanic ash, that kind of thing. All right, so once this stuff gets in the atmosphere, the atmosphere processes it. And the atmosphere processes it in a variety of ways. So the main thing that the atmosphere does is it moves it horizontally. But uh, all pollutants, not all, but almost all pollutants are emitted into the atmosphere at ground level because that's where people live, that's where our activities are. It's a couple of exceptions like jet aircraft exhaust or something. Uh, so winds close to the ground are relatively weak compared to winds higher up. So the pollution is not going to go very, very far unless it gets lofted into higher altitudes. So the atmosphere does that via mixing processes. So the same kinds of processes that cause thunderstorm clouds to grow very tall also carry pollution up to higher altitudes. And that's important not because they're at higher altitudes, but because at those higher altitudes, they can sample winds that are much stronger. So it blows them in different directions and at different speeds. It dif uh, disperses the pollutants, okay? Uh, and also, all these things are happening at the same time. Uh, another way in which the atmosphere processes these pollutants is that it changes them. It changes them chemically and physically. So chemical changes are basically chemical reactions. So for example, acid rain, you know, there's acids in the rain. Most of those are sulfuric acid and nitric acid. But when the pollutants that cause those acids are emitted into the atmosphere, they don't exist as sulfuric acid and nitric acid. They exist as other chemicals like sulfur dioxide and nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide and other things. So the chemical reactions occur over time. Now, many of these chemical reactions are accelerated in the presence of liquid water. So that means that when air is incorporated into a cloud, normal process happens all the time, the chemical reactions go much faster. Okay? Uh, and then the, those very same clouds, they absorb those chemicals. That's called scavenging. And uh, now the chemicals are no longer part of the air. They're part of the liquid water in the clouds or solid water if it's frozen. Then the last step is removal. Okay, so the general term for this process is acid rain, but technically we call it acid deposition because the removal doesn't have to be with liquid precipitation, with rain. It can be with solid precipitation, in other words, snow, and it can also be without precipitation at all. You know, you have uh, a molecule of gas, a gaseous pollutant, or a tiny microscopical, microscopic particle of some kind of pollutant happily moving along with the wind, and it can strike the leaf of a tree and stick. So it's removed. That's called dry deposition. So, and then also uh, fog is another thing in high altitudes. Uh, when, so fog is just, is a cloud. There's nothing special about fog. Fog is a cloud that occurs at ground level. So when the, the cloud droplets or fog droplets contain acids and a, a cloud droplet strikes the leaf of a tree or something, 
then the, that liquid and any pollutants it contains are removed. So that's fog deposition. All right. So in the why do we care department, um, acid rain uh, has some nasty effects on the environment. Now, as I said before, from a global, global perspective, acid rain is a very, very good thing. We would absolutely not want it to not exist because that would mean that the atmosphere would just get more and more and more and more concentrated over time until it's toxic and then we'd all die. So we want to have acid rain. However, when the pollutants come out over sensitive areas, then you have a problem. And by the way, now I'm straying from my area of expertise, which is meteorology, but uh, getting into the political arena, um, acid rain is a really difficult thing to legislate because this is what we call a long-range transport phenomenon, meaning that the pollution is emitted into the atmosphere by automobiles, factories, industrial processes, whatever, and then it comes out hundreds or even thousands of miles downwind. So, uh, you know, Canada, for example, southeastern Canada might be getting mad that uh, their forests are dying. Um, but they have no jurisdiction over the industry in the Ohio Valley, for example, that's mostly responsible for that kind of stuff. So acid rain is a difficult issue for that reason as well. Uh, fish are uh, particularly susceptible to um, acid rain, to the stresses of acid rain. And interestingly enough, it's mostly not the acidity of the water that harms the fish. What it is is the acidity of the water causes toxic metals, toxic chemicals to leach out of the soils and the rocks at the bottom of the lakes and rivers. And it's those toxic things that kill the critters. So again, just uh, another example of a complexity of acid rain. That's why it's a fascinating thing. And uh, the, probably one of the biggest problem is acid, of acid rain is acidified lakes. So uh, acidified lakes tend to occur in uh, areas that don't have a lot of topsoil. So uh, for example, the northeastern US, upstate New York, Maine, northern Wisconsin to some extent are areas that ha are very sensitive to the effects of acid rain. And uh, that's because the water, you know, it might not, the rainwater might not fall directly on the lake. It might fall in the surrounding area and drain into the lake. And soil has a, a buffering capacity. Soil has the effect of neutralizing the acids. So if there's not very much topsoil, then it goes into the lakes and rivers un neutralized, where it can be particularly damaging. And uh, I always think it's a kind of a beautiful but sad irony that uh, an acidified lake looks really beautiful. The water's crystal clear, but that's only because everything is dead inside. So uh, more near and dear to my heart, uh, Another problem with acid rain is its effects on uh, man-made structures, bridges, monuments, sculptures, etc. cetera. Uh, many of these structures are uh, subject to corrosion. And corrosion, by the way, is a natural process, you know, like uh, a piece of metal rusting when it's left outside. That's a natural process. It's basically a a slow release of the energy that was used to make that bicycle frame or whatever. It's natural. However, in the presence of acids, that process is accelerated. And uh, in terms of historical monuments, that's not something that you want. Uh, in Mexico, I mean, I should say in Latin America in general, but Mexico is uh, where I usually go. 
uh, most of the structures are made of limestone. And limestone is soft and it's malleable. That's why these ancient civilizations like the Aztecs and the Mayans and uh, the Zapotecs and the various civilizations that built the various structures, that's why they used limestone because it's easy to build with and also they had an abundant supply of it. And so this is what you see, stuff like this. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, science of acid rain. So in order to collect and to analyze, study acid rain, we use this very simple but clever instrument that's called a wet dry precipitation collector. So this consists of two buckets with a movable lid. And on one side, on the other side, the back side of this, there's a little sensor like this that is a moisture sensor and it's heated. So when it detects moisture, in other words, when raindrops start falling on it, then the lid moves from where it is over to the other side. So this bucket on the left there, we call the dry bucket, meaning it's only open when it's not raining. And that can be analyzed and measured to get an idea of the amount of dry deposition, the acids that come out of the atmosphere when it's not raining. When this sensor detects moisture, the bucket moves to the left, and this one is open, and so that's the wet bucket. This sensor has a heater, so the heater evaporates, slowly evaporates the liquid that's on it. So it's raining, it's raining, and finally it stops raining. The heater evaporates the remaining drops of liquid on it, and then the bucket moves back to its original location. And then uh, a human comes out and empties the bucket and puts it in a, a, a jar for storage to be analyzed later. So that's how uh, acid rain is collected, and it's, it's actually quite a simple process. Um, on my study abroad program, this is how acid rain is collected. <laughs> <clears throat> Students uh, carry around these uh, highly scientific uh, collection devices that I bought at a discount auto supply store. Um, we carry them around in um, sterilized bags and uh, until it starts raining. And then they whip them out and we collect them and then do our work with them. So um, when I was uh, in Mexico City in 2003, one of the guys there, Rogelio Soto is his name, he's uh, become one of my best friends actually. Uh, he was doing this very interesting project where he was able to get some samples of stone from one of the sites, from this El Tajin site in the state of Veracruz. And uh, that's no easy task because you have to get, you have to petition the government and et cetera. And what he did is he took some of these stone samples and cut them into some very precisely sized pieces that were perfectly smooth, okay? And he um, simulated many hundreds of years of rain falling on these things. So let me show you. So it's not the best picture in the world, but this is a little setup it's a box enclosed in plexiglass. It's about this wide, maybe this tall, like this. It's not really very huge. Here's the sun, right? Light bulb in there. So what he did was, using one of those uh, wet, dry precipitation collector, he collected acid rain in uh, that this one site in the state of Veracruz, Mexico, for two years. And he analyzed the chemical composition of the rain. Then he created artificial rain with the exact same chemical composition. And he dripped that artificial rain onto those four stone 
little stone ingots that I showed you in the last slide. And he did it in such a way that the cycles of sunlight, right, that light bulb, and rain mimicked the actual atmosphere. And so in a period of about three or four weeks, he was able to um, simulate five or 600 years of uh, acid rain corrosion. And then what he did is he analyzed those stones. And remember I told you that they had been sized very precisely and they were perfectly smooth. So any deviations in their size, he was able to measure very precisely. And what he found is that the corrosion or surface recession rates were somewhere around, you know, on the order of 10 or so micrometers per year. Now, a micrometer is one one thousandth of a millimeter. So this works out to be a couple of millimeters per century. So let's think about that for a second. A couple of millimeters per century. That's how fast these limestone structures are dissolving. So on the one hand, Seems like good news, right? I mean, oh good, we're, they're gonna be around for a while. You know, they're not gonna dissolve to the ground for quite, it's gonna take quite a few centuries. But actually this is really bad news because some of the most uh, precious parts of these structures are the frescoes, those are sculptures that are carved in the side, and paintings um, on the stucco coverings Paintings, you know, how thick is a, is a layer of paint? You know, it's just what? A handful of millimeters. And the frescoes aren't that much deeper than that. So this actually is quite an alarming rate of corrosion. So this is a big problem for Mexico. Um, of course, the biggest problem with air pollution in Mexico or anywhere else is the threat to human health. And that should be the biggest concern. In the United States, for example, we kind of have that under control. You know, with the exception of a couple times a year in Los Angeles, uh, air pollution is rarely a big, effect, a big threat to human health. Um, so, you know, we have turned our attention to the effects of air pollution on the environment, and we've been doing that here in the U.S. for decades. You know, everyone's worried about climate change now. Back in the 80s when I was in graduate school, it was acid rain. That was the big environmental issue of the day, just like... Um, climate changes now. In Mexico, they're just getting there now. Uh, they have the problem of uh, uh, air quality negatively impacting human health in Mexico City, which is one of the most polluted cities in the world. They're starting to get that under control. So now they're turning their attention to these other topics. And this is a big one because uh, it affects their cultural heritage. It affects tourism. So that's why, that's why they care. So here's what I do. All right, I'm a meteorologist. All, most of this stuff I was showing you is chemistry. I can, I can speak chemistry, you know, I can hold my own, but really I, I don't know all that much about chemistry. So what I do know about though is how pollution moves through the atmosphere. So what I was able to do uh, in support of... Uh, my friend Rogelio Soto's work with those stones and uh, Dr. Bravo's group's work in general is to try to figure out where the air that had that pollution, where the pollution in the rain came from. So I use this tool called trajectory models. So here's how it works. This is a little mathematical equation. But um, so here is a picture of a forward trajectory. So here's a location, it happens to be Monterey, Mexico. And the little line here shows the locations where air, which was here at this date and time, where it went over the next uh, two days. Okay, it followed that path. That's called a forward trajectory. This is the same thing, but in the opposite direction. This is a backward trajectory. So here you have the same location, Monterey, uh, the same date. But this line shows where the air that was in 
that location on that day where it came from. So you're tracking it backward in time. So these backward trajectories are actually the ones that are more relevant for air pollution studies. Because usually you have an area and it's polluted and you, you don't care where the air is going to go, you want to know where it came from. Okay, so this location here, this is a famous pyramid. It's called the Pyramid of the Niches. A niche, like a window, like a cubby hole. This pyramid here has 365 of those niches. So it was thought to be some kind of ancient calendar. Uh, this is in the northern part of the state of Veracruz, Mexico. That's Veracruz on the Gulf Coast. So um, what I did was I calculated using meteorological models that I have available to me, one of these trajectories, back trajectories that shows where the air came from uh, on its way to this area in Veracruz every day for five years. And then I split up the lines by month. Okay, so these are called spaghetti plots. So what you see here is basically two uh, patterns, or we call them flow regimes. So one of them is in the summer months here, where you have winds from the east. Okay, air is moving from here to here, with very few exceptions, one or two exceptions in a whole, uh, in five years worth of Julys, five years worth of Junes. All right. So if you know anything about meteor meteorology or climate, this shouldn't surprise you because. This is the tropics, and in the tropics, you have the trade winds, and the trade winds blow from the east or from the northeast. Okay? Now, in the other months of the year, basically from September through uh, April or so, you have kind of a half and half deal going on. About half the time, the winds are from the east, just like in the summer months, but the other half of the time, they're from the north. And those are called nortes. Spanish word for north. It uh, is what happens when you have the kind, excuse me, the kind of weather that we have here making its way south. Cold fronts penetrating into Mexico, for example. So it looks like the likely culprits for who put the garbage into the air that came out at this beautiful uh, archaeological site are mostly to the east of Veracruz and uh, s to some extent to the north. So here's another part of this analysis. Um, atmospheric motions are three-dimensional. You know, when we talk about wind, we think of it as two-dimensional. You know, the wind is northwest, you know, or we have a southerly wind or whatever but really there's a vertical component to the wind as well. And um, the typical um, vertical component of the wind is about one one hundredth as large as the horizontal component. So it's very small. But over a number of days, you can have, um, you know, a couple hundred meters or more of vertical movement. Okay, and that can be significant. So what this graph shows is here's altitude. What you see here plotted is pressure. Meteorologists love their barometers, you know. Uh, when the pressure goes down, altitude goes up. So although it says pressure, you can interpret this as altitude going up. Here's the months. Okay, so here's what this shows. During those uh, summer months, June, July, August, the bars are shorter, meaning that the air traveled at relatively low altitudes. During the other months, when the wind about half of the time was coming from the east and about half of the time was coming from the north, the air was traveling at very high altitudes. Now, if you have air moving over a smokestack and the air is one or two miles up, then that air is not going to pick up material from that smokestack. It's too high. That airstream is pretty much disconnected from the smokestack. 
But if that air is traveling at low levels over a smokestack, it will pick it up. So this analysis here suggests that it's the easterly winds, particularly during the summer, that are responsible, primarily responsible for the pollutants that are coming out of the rain at this site in Veracruz. So here's a, another map. This is the area we're talking about. Okay, so coming from the east means, I don't know if I'm steady enough here. Coming from the east means from this direction, like around where Cuba is, over to here. Okay, over the Gulf of Mexico. Now Mexico is a oil producing country. And uh, the, the lion's share of Mexico's oil operations are offshore oil platforms in the southern Gulf of Mexico, directly along the path. So this meteorological evidence suggests that Mexico's offshore oil operations are the culprits. And uh, Mexico, Mexico's environmental regulations are way more lax than they are in the US. So uh, it's, uh, it's interesting and kind of sad that uh, you know, it's Mexico that is polluting their own cultural heritage. Okay, so uh, I had this uh, Fulbright grant 10 years ago or so, I guess 11 years now, that um, supported my trip down to Mexico to, to get started on all this stuff. Since then, I've been going down there two or three times a year, every year, generally for several weeks in the summer, doing all kinds of uh, research and also teaching down there. One of the things that uh, I've always been interested is, uh, in is educational outreach. Um, so part of my project was to develop some kind of means for uh, kids, uh, particularly like middle school is the target age, middle school kids to learn about this stuff. So I developed these web pages that are called web quests. Those used to be popular about 10 years ago, right? And um, so these are available. You know, it's all done in the guise of the researchers. You know, this is my friend Rogelio Soto. This is Humberto Bravo. You know, on this website, it's, they're all teaching you about various aspects of acid rain. Uh, look at that, I'm very proud of that. It took me about 45 minutes to figure out how to make PowerPoint do that. <laughs> um, so this is a resource that actually has become quite popular amongst uh, um, middle school teachers in Wisconsin. So it's kind of a nice thing. Okay, so let, let me just sort of wind up here, get near the end with a few things about a few comments about the study abroad class. So this lady, her name is Chris Ruggiero. She's uh, one of my uh, best and most longtime friends on the UWM campus. She's the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And because I'm involved in Latin American stuff, I've known her for a long time. We've worked together in a variety of ways. Well, several years ago, uh, Chris and I were having lunch and she said, uh, um, have you ever thought about teaching a study abroad program about this topic? She says, I think students would enjoy learning about this. And I said, what's study abroad? I had never even heard of it. And she explained what study abroad is. And I said, no, we don't do that in atmospheric science, in the world of atmospheric science. We don't do that. And she very wisely said, why not? And I didn't really have an answer for that. I never thought about that. There was no good reason. So I went ahead and uh, over the next year or two, I developed the study abroad program, which uh, at the time, uh, this is supposed to be text. I have no idea why it looks like that. Um, at the time was the only study abroad program in the world of atmospheric science ever. Now, uh, some Googling has revealed two others. So 
uh, it's still a new thing in the world of atmospheric science. So we go in January, uh, the, the interim semester in between the fall and spring semester that we very cleverly at UWM call winterim. Uh, do you guys call it that here? Yes, okay, you guys are clever too. Uh, so we go to these five locations that are not called five pound sign uh, percent. Uh, this January, this coming January, will be the fifth time, the fifth group I've brought down there. Uh, application deadline is October 15th, so we've got plenty of time if anybody's interested. Uh, people from uh, other universities and colleges besides UWM are welcome. We have uh, had people from other places come. So I'll tell you just a little bit about this program to sort of close things out. So uh, the main goal of the program is a science, you know, it's a science topic. It's the topic of acid rain damage to these wonderful archaeological sites or environmental corrosion is the buzzword for that. But um, at the same time, uh, students learn all kinds of other stuff like uh, a lot of history and culture and anthropology and archaeology associated with the peoples who built these places. Uh, and in these places, descendants of those people live there still in every, in every case. So the cultures are very different and they're very vibrant. Uh, it's a two-week program. I think it's actually 16 days. Uh, so we start out with either one or two days. This coming January, it's going to be one day of classroom stuff at UWM. Uh, and uh, then we go to Mexico, and we go to five locations. So it's very much a travel program. Uh, most study abroad programs, you go to a place, you know, some wonderful place like Spain or, you know, whatever, and you stay in one place, and there might be an excursion or two. We're always on the move. We don't stay in any one place for more than three or, in one case, four days. Uh, when we're at these various places, we go to some combination of archaeological sites, uh, museums, and universities to study uh, this topic in a variety of ways. So, at this one day, during this one day of classroom stuff at UWM, uh, they learn, the students learn from me uh, the basics of, you know, the science topics that are related to this whole business of environmental corrosion. And also, um, they get some Spanish. Okay. Then we go to Mexico and... Uh, we go to a variety of archaeological sites. The ones with the asterisks are the places that we're going to in uh, January, upcoming January. I switch it up a little bit, change locations a little bit each year, just mainly to keep it interesting for me, because one of these years I'm going to burn out on this, and I don't want to because I love it, you know, so I try to make it last for me as long as possible. Uh, here the groupers were, were uh, outside of Palenque and were watching monkeys in the trees. <clears throat> okay, we go to these great museums. This is the real Aztec calendar, uh, which isn't a calendar at all, actually. See these here? Those are bullet holes by the American soldiers who found it and used it for target practice because they had no idea that what they were, what they were looking at was something precious. So we visit universities. Uh, last couple of years, I've been going to uh, Ciudad del Carmen, which is in the state of Campeche in the southeast. But uh, other years, we visited other universities. The community of uh, researchers in Mexico that work with air pollution research is relatively small. And I know everybody because it's small. And I'm in that world too. So I call up my university buddies there and I say, hey, can I bring a group of students down there? And then we do things, you know, like 
presentations. Our group gives presentations. They give presentations. Nobody understands a word of it because they're speaking Spanish, we're speaking English. And then we all go out afterwards and everyone becomes best friends and suddenly everybody understands each other. It's amazing how that works. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm running a little late, so let me just uh, uh, finish up here. So um, this is just a little history. We've gone four years so far. The groups are, have been small, either eight or ten people. It by no means is an atmospheric science only thing. Uh, some years there's only two atmospheric science majors. We get people from all across the board. So um, uh, being a professor and being in the publisher parish business, you know, we have to write articles about stuff. So uh, I recently wrote an article in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. I'm sure you all subscribe to that, right? Um, describing this uh, program and uh, there are a number of copies of that if anybody is interested. Also being passed around are uh, like a one page flyer with information about the class and a detailed syllabus, which is like a 20, five or so page document that tells you exactly what we do every hour of every day. So if you're interested, you're welcome to uh, take a look at those things. So um, the, I wanted to show this picture. So this is one of our students. His name is Al. Uh, we went to this little town in Veracruz called Papantla. And uh, he was sitting down just kind of you know, chilling on a bench, and uh, this one family came up and put their baby in his lap yeah. because they never had seen an African American person before, and they thought it would be good luck for their child. Very sweet. Anyways, I think I'll end here. Thank you for listening.